الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين على أمور الدنيا والدين والعاقبة المتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته ودعا بدعوته إلى يوم الدين إن شاء الله تعالى this is going to be a regular series if Allah wills every Friday around this time we will be going through some of the قصص the stories that was told by our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And ikhwani fillah, what you will find is that uh, there is a reason why there are so many stories in the Quran. There is a reason why there are so many stories in the Sunnah. And there is a reason why people enjoy stories. Uh, we tell them to our children. We like to listen to them. Uh, when you're being told a story, you tend to be able to focus longer and retain the knowledge you gain from it. So it is a very a good mechanism of conveying a message. But it's always important to remember the purpose of these qasas. And it is not just to enjoy. It's not just to uh, entertain or to... to it is more than that. And you will find that there are many benefits in, in listening to the stories that were told by Rasulullah wasallam and told by Allah in the Qur'an. And uh, the scholars, when they mention these benefits... One of the benefits they mention is It is for you to find lessons from these stories And you can really sum it up uh, quite simply Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes tells us about uh, Prophets and awliya and great people And the purpose is for you to look the, into their story And to try and be more like them And to benefit lessons from their lives you, when you hear about Maryam alayhi salam and how she was a devout worshipper, that should encourage you to worship. When you hear about Zakaria alayhi salam and how he it was inspired by Maryam to call upon Allah and ask for a child at an old age to never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. When you hear the story of Isa or the story of Musa alayhi salam that comes often. All these benefits are for you to look into these stories and take ibrah and lessons and, and to admonish yourself and benefit from it. Another benefit is... Uh, Tathbeet, it is to find, uh, to affirm yourself and to find uh, solace and comfort into the stories that of the people that came before us, especially for the Prophet wasallam himself. When the Prophet had a mission to call the people to Islam and to Tawheed, and it was a difficult mission, and sometimes he would struggle. But when Allah then tells him about the Prophets that came before him, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to him that what is said to you uh, is what has been said to the messengers that came before you. What is done to you is what is done to the messengers that came before you. If you have been rejected, so have the prophets that came before you. This would give the Prophet ﷺ, uh, right? Uh, and so there are many benefits from these stories, ikhwani fillah. And you will find also the opposite when Allah tells us about Iblis. Allah tells us about the Shaytan. Allah tells us about the Fir'aun. Allah tells us about uh, these tyrants and these evil people. It is for you to avoid what they did. It's for you to avoid what they did. So each time there's lessons in them. And you will find that even the lessons, the stories that the Prophet ﷺ tells, they're not only for entertainment. You can always extract benefits from it. And this is the purpose of this halaqa, inshaAllah ta'ala. We will all, every week we'll go through one qissa or maybe two. And then we will ponder over it, inshaAllah ta'ala, extract benefits from it and see how it can apply to our life. Um, another thing to remember, ikhwani fillah, is that we are here in a majlis of dhikr. And just sitting here is an ibadah. There is tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, we are in the, uh, a masjid, a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped, the most beloved places to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that we should thank Allah for giving us the guidance to come to the masjid, the guidance to come together and do dhikr of these ahadith and these ayat. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those that are truly in these gatherings. These are the gatherings that the angels love, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, send his rahmah upon us. Uh, Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Um, another thing is, uh, the brothers of the masjid, they mentioned that we, because this is a weekly thing, that we will have a, uh, after four weeks, or after a few weeks, we will have like a quiz or a trivia night where we ask questions about some of the fawaid that we shared today. And so the following weeks, every story that we go through, I'm sharing benefits. And there's going to be a, a night where we come together and we ask questions, right? And inshallah ta'ala, there's going to be some jawais, some, some prizes as well. 
So uh, that's an encouragement to, to kind of uh, pay attention, if you will, or try and remember the fawaid, inshallah ta'ala. Um, perhaps more detail will be shared by the brothers of, of, of the idara. Tayyib. So today, inshallah ta'ala, uh, the qisa that I want to share with you guys is in Bukhari and in Muslim, and in many actual books it's been mentioned. And there are many benefits that we can learn from the story, ikhwani fillah. And this is narrated by uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. It's narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. And it's a story that I, I think a lot of you have heard before. But ikhwani fillah, if you think about it, how many times do we read the Qur'an and we come across the same qasas, the same stories? It's okay for you to hear a story again because you will benefit something new or it will remind you. So this is the qissa of the man who killed 99 men and he was on a journey to repent. He was on a journey to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when... This is a very interesting story because it has something to do with the people that came before us. And there's something you should always remember. Whenever we discuss the people that came before us, especially the Ahl Kitab, their shara'i' was different than ours. Meaning what? Some of the detailed rulings was different. They might not have prayed as much as we do. Or maybe they prayed more. Or some things were halal for them or halal for us. Or how certain things are dealt with are different, right? Which is why you should always keep in mind that uh, the... Uh, when we take benefits from them, that sometimes you might come across something that you don't find familiar, or it's not again, it's not what we find in our Sharia, and it's important to remember that, especially with these qasas, because a lot of times they are from the people that came before us, and the rule generally, generally is that we don't extract rulings uh, from, uh, or we we need to appreciate that the Sharia was different, that the Sharia were different. But a lot of them is the same. For example, the concept of Tawbah stays the same. Anything regarding Aqeedah stays the same. Anything that was told from the past or the future stays the same because what, what becomes different are the rulings but not what is being told nor the, the, the belief. That's the same. Like the Prophet said in the Hadith, the religion of the Prophet is one. So the Prophet is telling us of, of one of the men that came before and he was a man that was a killer, a murderer, a criminal. And he killed many people. I mean, think about it, 99. How many people do that? How many people actually physically? Well, nowadays you might find someone that killed a lot of people, but it might be through, I don't know, drone strikes or from far, or it's very impersonal uh, or, or whatever. Or, but so, so to actually murder 99 people with your sword, this is something that you would assume is the worst of the worst. And Ikhwan Ifillah, you also have to remember that that qatl or killing is one of the greatest sin, in, sins in Islam. And in fact, some of our Salaf would say it's a sin that is not forgiven. And this is very relevant to our story. We know that Allah forgives all sins, right? There is actually a madhab that is uh, mentioned is the madhab of Ibn Abbas, the, uh, the madhab of um, uh, the great scholar and, and companion of the Prophet and his cousin Abdullah ibn Abbas that an al-qatl, that killing, is actually not forgiven. It's similar to shirk. That an al-qatl la yughfar. And he has no tawbah. But this is also something that is in dispute. So some scholars, they say, no, he didn't actually believe this. But he would give this fatwa based on the circumstances. This is why you will find. And uh, this hadith is quoted a lot in, in the story as well. Because um, you, you will find some narrations of Ibn Abbas saying that the person that kills is not forgiven. And some of the evidence that suggests to it is in Surah An-Nisa, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that uh, the person that kills another believer on purpose, that uh, his, his punishment or it will be the hellfire Jahannam, and he will abide in there forever. And this is some of the evidence that suggests that the person, well, if you're going to be in hellfire forever, then that means that sin is not forgiven. But this is to highlight, first of all, the severity of killing someone else, ikhwani fillah. The severity of killing is one of the most major of major sins. But the scholars that say that um, this was not the matter of Ibn Abbas, they, they refer, for example, a hadith that's in Adab al-Mufrad, where a man came to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and said to him, I, uh, I, I fell in love with a woman and I wanted to marry her. Uh, and then uh, she married someone else. And he became jealous and he killed her. And they said, Halli min tawba. Do I have any, can I repent? I've, I'm jealous, I've killed her. Can I repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
And the Abbas asked him uh, whether his mother is alive. Are you saying mother alive? And he said no. And then Ibn Abbas عنه, said that if that's the case, then you should uh, do as much khair as you can uh, and repent as much as you can. But he didn't guarantee him that he could be, he will be forgiven or anything like that. So but the scholars, they use this as an evidence that Ibn Abbas didn't necessarily believe that the murderer is not forgiven. But other times he would say to people that uh, killed that they are not forgiven. And Imam Nawi mentioned that the reason is he used to say that to kind of discourage, to scare people and to discourage them. And, and this is why uh, there's another narration that mentions that a man comes to Abdullah ibn Abbas and says to him, uh, I, I want to, um, what's the ruling of killing? And then he said to him, uh, the ruling of killing is that it is not forgiven. It is a sin that is not forgiven if you, if you do that. And then uh, his students, some of the tabi'een said, you gave a fatwa that you don't give to us. And then Ibn Abbas said, uh, he looked to me like a person that was angry and was wanting to kill. And then they said, we followed him and this was the case. We followed him and this was the case. So this is a scholar's kind of, uh, but because there are statements of Ibn Abbas saying that the murder is not forgiven, they had to contextualize that, which is why they mentioned all these other evidence to suggest that that wasn't really his madhab. In any case, if you are ever in the conversation of whether you're going to be forgiven or not, you are in a severe situation. Um, so this man, he killed 99 people. And this story, Ikhwani Fillah, it has many benefits, but let's go through it. So then he wants to make tawbah. And this shows you, Ikhwani Fillah, uh, that, uh, subhanAllah, no matter how much sin one commits, that if there is khair in you, you will want to repent, right? And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives tawfiq for the person's repentance, no matter what kind of sin they are in. This man has killed so many people, but yet Allah has given in, has planted in him the seed, the need to repent. And this is why some of the ulama, when they explain the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at tawab, they say, that Allah is the one that gives you the want, the need to, to, to repent to begin with. This is why uh, um, when Allah says, ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُوا right? Surah Tawbah, ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُوا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initiated in them the need to repent, then Allah accepted their repentance. So subhanAllah, you are in sin. That need, that want to repent comes from Allah. It's tawfiq min Allah. Right? Then you repent, then Allah accepts your repentance. And this shows you how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So this man, no matter, look at how much he did, and he still wants to repent. This ikhwani min feels, if you are missing your prayers, you can repent. If you have been doing backbiting, you can repent. If you have been uh, uh, um, unkind to your mother or your brother, you can repent. If you have sinned, ikhwani fillah, if the man who killed the 99 men can find within himself a need to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so can you, ikhwani fillah, no matter what sin you're in, if it's financial sin, if it is something else that you're doing, we all have our shortcomings. Hasten to the repentance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he can do it, surely you can do it as well. So then he, he wants to repent, but he doesn't know how, and he asks people to show them to show to him the most knowledgeable in that land. And this shows you how smart he was. I mean, um, he is looking for the most knowledgeable. So you understand that he needs his fatwa, his religious guidance from the scholars. So he's looking for a scholar. But then they, went, they showed him a rahib, a worshipper. And then he goes to the rahib. A rahib is a abid, a worshipper. Now this is important for you to remember that ilm and ibadah are two different things. Ilm and ibadah are two different things. Knowledge is not like ibadah. This is why al muta'abida or al mutanassika people that worship Allah, the ruhban, people that are involved in a lot of ibadah, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are the people you go back to for knowledge. And one of the greatest mashakil and problems we have as an ummah is al khalt bayn al ulama wal awam, or bayn al ulama wal ibad, is that we mix between the scholars and the worshippers, the scholars and the regular folks, right? And this is a, this is a big, big musibah, ikhwani fillah. We should go back for our fatawa and our religious guidance to the Ahlul Ilm. And if you don't do that, if you don't do that, if you go to anyone that is wearing a thobe and has a big beard, then they will misguide. And this is among the signs that the Prophet Sallallahu foretold, that there will be a time when people will go to the ignorant people for guidance, and they will misguide others and misguide themselves. May Allah protect us from that. 
so he is told to go to a worshiper. And he goes to a rahib and he goes. And one of the interesting fawaid that the scholars bring is that the one that is involved in worship and is away from sin, uh, sin becomes something great in his eyes, right? Because he's so away from it, right? And I'm sure you've noticed that if you, if you know, so especially really practicing sisters and brothers, uh, if you compare them to maybe people that are not so so much or they or someone that are, they are not involved, certain things they will, they will be very surprised. Um, I remember uh, it was one of our mashayikh. He he came he came from from Saudi and he was giving talks here. Uh, may Allah preserve him. And he was taken to a restaurant. And it was a Muslim restaurant. Uh, for example, right now when we go to restaurants, uh, the restaurants that are in the Muslim areas, the, you find uh, a lot more semblance of an Islamic uh, guidelines. Uh, sisters and brothers are not usually in the same place. And Alhamdulillah, right? But things that we find normal because you are in here. When he saw it, he was shocked. Like, it was like astaghfirullah. And uh, it's like, Shaykh, this is the this is the best that we have. Like, we, I mean, uh, there's no music, there's no ikhtilat. Uh, but the fact that it, it was it was he was so it was so foreign to him. So he's, you're gonna have an, a kind of an adverse reaction to that. So this is what happened to the rahib. He was like, you killed 99 people, astaghfirullah. And he said, no, there is no toba for you. There is no toba for you. He said, and that's a very uh, big claim. He said, you killed 99 people. There is no toba for you. And what did this man do? Yuqal, it is said that, uh, that he had qillatu ilm wa qillatu aql. He didn't have, he had little knowledge, but he also had little hikmah and wisdom. If this man, and uh, one of the things that you pay from the hadith is this man, he was carrying his weapon because he killed him right there and then. So how are you going to anger an armed killer? Right? It's not a smart thing to do. Well, that's what he did. Uh, uh, so he said to him, yeah, you have no tawbah. And, uh, if the, and then he killed him. So he was killed. And this is why they say ignorance is that un qatil. Like Ibn Qayyim mentioned there. Right? Jahal and ignorance, it can literally, this time it literally killed, right? This man lost his life. He killed a hundred people now. And he still wants to repent. This is Shay Ajib if you really think about it. He just committed another murder, 100 people, right? I don't think there's a hundred people in this room right now. I don't think there's If you look around, can you imagine killing all of these people, right? And still looking for Toba. So he, he just killed someone, Wamazala, you read Toba, he still wants to, to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what's interesting is, this is a khwanif that shows you that don't ever underestimate the Iman of the believer. The Iman of the believer. It was, uh, uh, you, you all know the hadith of the woman that was involved in, 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 uh, in haram, right? As it relates to, to, to zina. And yet she, she gave water to, to a dog and Allah forgave her. Your iman can lead to you doing something good, ikhwani fillah, even if you're immersed in a sin. So this is why uh, what part of our aqidah is that we distinguish between the fisq of the person and their iman. And we say, uh, And we, we, we appreciate the iman in them while hating the, the fisq, of course. But, we, but a lot of times you forget that. And we tend to characterize the person based on their sins alone. So if you know someone, ikhwani fillah, that is immersed in one type of sin or another, don't forget that they are also believers. And that the iman in them is something azim. It's something عظيم. and and that iman can be a reason for them to come back. So never underestimate the power of their faith and their iman. Look at this man; he is a murderer, yet he is still looking a way out. He is looking for repentance, and if he can do that, many of us can as well. Inshallah, Taala may Allah accept our repentance. So, Ikhwani fi Allah, he then says again: Can can, you, can someone show me to someone that is is knowledgeable? He understands that he needs someone that's knowledgeable. Subhanallah. And then finally he was shown to a man who had ilm. Who had ilm. So he goes to him and he says to him, I have killed a hundred people. Do I have any tawbah? And he mentions, yes. And who can stop you between you and your tawbah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who can stand between you and Allah? Yeah, of course you can repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a, a, a beautiful aqidah that we have that there is nothing between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you should remind yourself of that when you want to repent, but also when you are worshipping, when you are in need, when you are trusting, 
that لا أحد بينك وبين الله سبحانه وتعالى. You don't need anyone to go through to get to Allah Almighty. Allah is Samir. He is Qareeb. He is Mujib al-Dua. So it's very important to remember that Allah is the one that hears and, and, and He's the one that accepts your dua, He accepts your repentance. So have your heart connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So He says, yes, you can repent to Allah, but then He gave him sound advice. And He said to him, leave this land. Migrate away from this land that you have been sinning in. And this, Ikhwan, if you like, shows you the benefit of moving away from the environment that pushes you towards sin. And sometimes moving away from the environment means changing cities. But sometimes it could mean changing jobs, changing schools, changing the college that you're at or the university. It could mean changing your friends. It, it could mean, but it, the important is that you separate yourself from some of the things that are pushing you towards this masya or this sin. And this is part of your tawbah. And this helps your tawbah as well and it shows how sincere you are in your repentance. Um, so whatever the problem is that is pushing you towards this sin, trying to get rid of that. So he tells him to move away from this land and some of the riwayat mentioned, like a riwayat that is narrated by Ma'awun and Sufyan, that he told him, that they named the cities, leave this city for it is a city of Su ila ardin yu'badu fiha Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a land where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped or qawmun fiha qawmun ya'abudun Allah. There is a, a people that worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, here you benefit the importance of surrounding yourself with people that worship Allah, that are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now this man, he becomes happy and now he, he believes that he, there is a chance for him. And he takes this sound advice and he goes. And he embarks on his journey. There is a reality that many of us um, tend to forget. And the dunya makes us forget. And we are human beings and we tend to forget. And that's the reality of death. right? Death doesn't wait for an opportune moment. It won't come to you at, just at old age or in a good moment. Any time it can happen. And death came to this man on his way to the city, on his way to realize, to realize his tawbah and to change his ways, death came to him. And which angel is the angel that takes the soul? Malakul Mawt. Malakul Mawt. Sometimes you hear people, they say it's Azrael, but that name is not authentic. Uh, there is no authentic narration mentioning that name. It is, Allah calls him Malakul Mawt in the Quran, and that is who he is. But Malakul Mawt takes the life. But after that, it is uh, then uh, handed over to two types of angels. Malaikatul Rahmah wa Malaikatul Adab. May Allah make us among those whose souls are given to Malaikatul Rahmah, the angels of mercy. And something quite interesting happened here, Ikhwani Fillah, and that is that the angels of mercy, they, they descended to take his soul and also the angels of Adab. And then they started discussing and arguing uh, over what should happen and they each brought forth a case for where this man should go so the malaika of Turrahma they said Ja'a muqbilan ila Allah ta'iban this man he came to repent he left the city his heart was towards Allah Almighty he should be forgiven and therefore we should take his soul the angels of Adab they said he killed a hundred people and he has done no good. So therefore, we should take him. There's a narration that mentions that someone else was there as well. And that was Iblis. Iblis was there as well. And قال, بَلْ أَنَا أَوْلَى بِهِ This man, I should have him. Or he is, I should be his companion, or he should be for me. And why is that? Because, he said, لم يعصني في حياته قط. He never disobeyed me. The Iblis is saying this. This man never disobeyed. Meaning every evil I commanded him, he did. Right? Subhanallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. So, um, so what happened to him? Allah subhanahu wa taala sent an angel على سورة بني آدم على سورة إنسان. An angel came in the form of a man. حكم بينهم as a judge between them. And this angel, it came to judge uh, and, 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 and uh, between who? Between the two angels, the angels of Rahmah, mercy, and the angels of Adab. What's going to happen to his soul? And when he listened to both sides, he said, we are going, he was commanded, he's, of course, he was commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
to measure where he was. Looking at where he came from and where he was going and to whichever land he was closer to, he will be judged by. So if he's closer to the land he was going through to repent, to become a better uh, person, he will be from Ahl Jannah. If he's closer to the land where he came from, where he committed all these sins, then he's going to be from Ahl Nar. And he was closer by a shibr, right? a, a hand span to the land of, that he was going to. And he was forgiven. And somebody why mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he commanded the, 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 this, the land he was going to to come closer. And the land where he came from to go further. In other words, Allah wanted to show him mercy and forgive his sins. This man was forgiven, Ikhwani Fillah. This hadith, there are so many benefits we can learn from Ikhwani Fillah, but the main, main thing is, is tawbah, repentance, Ikhwani Fillah. Repent from your sins. The Prophet Sallallahu used to repent more than a hundred times a day, and, and you know who he was, right? Allah forgave what he did in, in the past and in the future. He was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he's repenting a hundred times a day, how many times should we be repenting? Ikhwan al-Fillah, Tawbah within itself is a great ibadah and from its fawaid is that it destroys what came before it. Meaning what? That your sins are forgiven. Whoever repents, Allah accepts his repentance. In fact, there is a discussion among scholars. The person that sins, then repents, is he, does he, do you become better than before you even sinned? Meaning what? You have a person called Ali. He committed a sin. No doubt that he was better before he committed that sin, right? Ali, before the sin, was a better man than after the sin. But then he repented. So who's better? The Ali that sinned and repented, or the Ali that never sinned to begin with? So they say, no, now that he repented, because it is his nature to sin. And now he repented, so he will be hal afdal. He is now even better. And this is why the Prophet said in a hadith that if you were not to sin, Allah would bring forth people that do sin and then repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so it's it's كل من آدم خطاء وخير الخطائين التوابون. Right, every all of mankind often fall into mistakes, but the best of them of in sin and the best of them are those who repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala often. طيب. So uh, the, one of the faiz مشروعية التوبة. We also mentioned the danger and the and how evil uh, killing and قتل is to the point where there was uh, some khilaf. However, yasir that in, in the acceptance of the repentance. And wallahi, read that ayah one more time. وَمَنْ يَقْتُ الْمُؤْمِنَ الْمُتَعَمِّدٍ فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمُ Allah mentions that the person that kills a believer on purpose, that his, his reward is hellfire. May Allah protect us from it. وَغَضِبُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ And خَالِدٍ فِيهَا And he will abide in there. وَغَضِبُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ Allah's anger will be upon him and his wrath. وَلَعَنْ And Allah's curse. May Allah protect us. وَعَدَّلُهُ عَذَابٍ عَظِيمًا And he will have a great punishment. So these are, this is not, it's not an easy matter. But although it's not an easy matter, there's nothing greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah accepts repentance. Another benefit of the hadith of Khwani Fillah is the, the danger of ignorance and how you should never give a fatwa or an advice based upon ignorance and that you should learn for that rahib that was skilled, that worshipper that was skilled because of his ignorance. And he said, Allah will never accept repentance. It shows you the importance of ilm and the danger of ignorance. One of the benefits of the hadith is that angels do ijtihad. The angels... They don't have all the answers and sometimes they do ijtihad and they discuss and they look into matters and that they could be wrong and right. Yes, they don't disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but this shows you that even they sometimes they have to look into a matter and see and, and weigh it. It shows you, ikhwani fillah, the mashru'iya of safaru uh, to travel away from the land that you, put, that you sin in. Uh, among the benefits of the hadith is the virtue of the scholar. And how beneficial it is. The scholars, they say that عَالِمٌ وَاحِدْ أَفْضَلْ مِنْ أَلْفْ عَابِدْ That one scholar is better than a thousand worshippers. Because it's ilm that in the end of the day is where you find salvation and, and knowledge. And that you see how Allah praises knowledge in the Qur'an. Imam al ghurdi mentions that when, when, when Allah told the Prophet to say, Oh Allah, increase me knowledge. Oh Qurrabi, zidni ilma. If there was anything more beneficial, anything more greater than knowledge, surely Allah would have asked him to increase him in that. But the one thing he was told to ask more of was what? Was ilm. May Allah give us ilm nafi'ah. Um, we also benefit from this hadith that uh, the tawbah of the qatil is accepted, that the repentance of the, of, the, of the murderer is accepted. And ikhwani fillah, uh, also uh, one of the benefits is that when two groups are 
quarreling or, or, or arguing or and then someone it becomes their hakam bainahum. Someone is now at the intermediary, someone is now judging and we're gonna see that they should listen to that person and take his ruling. Right? So uh, and this is very important, even in when we are solving marital issues. Allah mentions It is if you don't listen to the person that is judging between the two uh, opposing factions, if they don't hear the person or listen to him or or accept his ruling, then it's going to be chaos, right? Imagine that the malaika of Rahma malaika of Adab said, yeah, no, we're not going to take this. It would be mushkila. So it shows you the importance of listening to that person that comes. Uh, there's many, many, many benefits that we can extract from this hadith. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those that constantly repent to Allah uh, Almighty. Barakallahu feekum, inshaAllah ta'ala. We're going to conclude this, the, this qissa here today. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us. Barakallahu feekum. Hada wa akhru da'wana. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.